Um, thanks. I think we'll get started. I'm going to introduce our first speaker today, Eric Rudolfker. Um, his uh, title, oh, change, that's all right. Uh, his um, research mentor is Larry Allen. Um, he graduated from uh, school of uh, medical school at the University of Rochester in 2017, um, and they did uh, internal medicine residency, as well as staying as a chief uh, resident in quality and safety here at the University of Colorado, um, and then started a cardiology fellowship in 2021. Um, Eric is going to be talking to us about interhospital transfers for heart failure. All right, thanks. I have no uh, disclosures today. Um, so let me uh, set the stage here. Um, this is, you know, this past weekend, my grandmother was in town for Mother's Day, and she asked what I was going to be talking about today. And I said, transfer, you know, when patients transfer from one hospital to another hospital. And she said, oh, well, you know, I'm sure they do that to, you know, improve the care so that they have a better outcome. Um, and of course, that's always the intent uh, when making any clinical decision. Um, but to, you know, put that from the perspective of the receiving person, you know, this might be us on a busy day on, on rounds um, when we're seeing a bunch of sick people and then, you know, our pager goes off and uh, it might be the ER doctor saying, you know, hey, I'd like you to see this person and uh, downstairs. Um, they're 72 years old. They have heart failure. They were just here admitted last month. They follow in the clinic here. They're coming back in with new heart failure. And you might say, great, and be able to quickly synthesize all of the data that has been generated on this patient's care, including their last echo, lab data, um, have direct access to their doctor's notes and their intentions, big picture view of their care. And then contrast that um, with the same scenario, but this time when the phone rings, it's a nurse. And the nurse, uh, he or she says, hey, that transfer from Montrose is here. The family has some questions for you, and I need admission orders. And they have uh, essentially a blank chart uh, when you open them up. Um, so this is our experience initiating the care of sometimes very sick patients that are transferred um, and how I got uh, interested in studying more about why uh, patients transfer to other hospitals and um, what happens to those patients. So uh, this is not a very well-studied topic, but there are some studies uh, that have shown that transfer occurs 1% to 4% of the time, although it tends to be more common in critical illness. Um, and cardiology uh, diagnoses are actually the most common reason. Almost half of transfers are for a cardiology reason. Um, in this one Medicare-based study that uh, propensity score matched patients that had transferred and uh, patients that didn't transfer uh, with similar conditions, they suggested that perhaps there was um, increased 30-day mortality uh, in patients with acute MI, in patients with um, heart failure. Um, with improved mortality, perhaps, in patients with acute MI that are transferring. Many reasons for that, you know, for acute MI, it might be that um, the hospital you went to didn't have the ability to give you a stent and, um, you know, to treat your heart attack. Uh, but in things like heart failure, it's a little bit less clear why that, that might be. Um, so why should we study um, transfers? I mean, transfers are costly. Medical transport alone can be upwards of $30,000 per, per case. Um, testing is often duplicated if you don't have the raw data that the patient's coming with, and that can add additional system cost. Um, and then the length of stay, uh, on average, it can be up to twice that of non-transferred patients. So the consequences of all these, um, you may think, well, it's worth it if they're getting improved care, but we actually don't have very good data uh, on the outcomes of transferred patients. So from our standpoint at a quaternary medical center, um, my experience, at least anecdotally, has been that we get you know, intermediate to high acuity patients that transfer here um, for specialty procedures or services. This might be um, someone that is at another hospital in VT storm, and despite the normal treatments that they've gone through, um, they want specialty things like um, SBRT, a radiation therapy that we offer here and, and not at other centers. And then sometimes we get really, really, really sick people that kind of have no other options and transfer here um, to get the specialty care to see if they may be able to, 
um, to get things like ECMO or transplant mechanical support. Um, so specialty procedures seems like a really good reason to transfer. And, and this one study looked at um, for transferring patients within, with acute MI, um, do they get any of these, what percentage of them get these procedures as captured by ICD-10 codes, or sorry, ICD-9, this is a little bit older. And um, in this case of the acute MI patients, actually 38% of them didn't receive any of these procedures at either hospital. Um, and then about a third received them at the, got them at the receiving hospital only. Um, so this doesn't seem to be a plausible explanation for um, exactly why patients transfer. And what happens here at our uh, own uh, site, uh, UC Health um, data, uh, of our patients with acute MI, 22% of them were transferred, um, but those accounted for 40% of the acute MI de deaths, um, so disproportionately uh, represented in the mortality category. And it's pretty similar for heart failure with smaller numbers. So 10% of our heart failures came, patients came from another hospital, yet of all of our mortalities, 38% um, were transferred. Um, and these are pretty big numbers. Last year, UC Health as a system, which has 12 or 13 hospitals now, um, received over 11,000 um, transfers. And these uh, patients overall had a very uh, high death rate, 8% um, within the hospitalization. And of those, a quarter of them were within 48 hours of getting here. And 71% uh, didn't receive any procedures or significant diagnostic testing. Um, so it definitely, um, you know, makes us think about what is going on here. So to study this further, I submitted a proposal to the American Heart Association's Get With the Guidelines Heart Failure Registry. Uh, this is a registry with over 700 uh, participating hospital sites that submit data on heart failure hospitalizations as captured by ICD-10 code. And then analysis proposals are reviewed by a team um, and a statistician and clinician teams, uh, you know, once or twice a year, go through, select proposals, and then send data back. Uh, and this has resulted in hundreds of publications um, and has been uh, very useful, especially in the quality improvement realm. Uh, so the primary objectives of my proposal were to describe the baseline patient characteristics, outcomes, and procedures in the study population stratified by transferred status. Um, we wanted to evaluate differences in in-hospital outcomes between transferred and non-transferred patients, and then assess the proportion of heart failure admissions that are transfers over time. Um, and then we performed those three an analyses comparing heart transplant centers to non-heart um, transplant centers, which may have different patient uh, characteristics. Um, so we took registry patients from the prior seven years with a primary diagnosis of heart failure. Um, we excluded patients that had a lot of missing data um, or they didn't have the admit source info. Uh, we excluded patients that had already had a heart transplant or an LVAD implanted, um, since those patients transfer for, to, to specialty centers for different reasons than patients without those things. And then if you transferred to another facility as your disposition, we excluded those patients as well um, so that we weren't counting the patients twice if you were admitted to a participating site and then transferred to another participating site. And um, with that, we ended up with 662,000 patients across 622 sites. Um, and um, of those, about a quarter um, were represented by um, transplant centers. This will be found for the proportion of transferred patients. Um, overall in the cohort, 5% were transferred. Uh, and um, there were some slight geographic differences with transfer being more common in the West um, and a little less common in the Northeast. Uh, interestingly, we found that small hospitals received a higher proportion of transfers um, compared to medium hospitals, and then large hospitals were, were slightly higher also. Um, and then um, by academic centers, it was slightly higher at um, you know, places that had trainees, uh, six versus four percent, and similar trends in transplant versus non-transplant centers, six and a half versus five point two percent. We looked at this over time. Um, I don't have a great graphic for this, but um, the rate of transfer um, hovered between five and six percent over the last seven years without really any significant variability 
Um, so this is uh, that data in um, table form, stratified by the transferred status. Think of note, we used absolute standard difference uh, for this study as opposed to p-values. We're comparing groups that we know that are inherently different. So we compared transferred to non-transferred patients. So every column would have had a significant p-value. Um, absolute standard difference allows us to see the, the um, how imbalanced those groups are in a more numeric scale. Um, and anything over 10% is considered to be an imbalanced group. Um, I think other things, you know, of the hospital characteristics to note is that the rural location hospitals uh, accepted the same number of transfers, uh, you know, as um, or they accepted a lower amount of transfers, only only three percent, um, but they um, did not make up. Um, there was no change in the transferred rate uh, based on a rural location, um, and then hospital ownership did not make a difference either. Um, so for the patient characteristics, um, on average, uh, transferred patients were younger by about three years, and they were more likely to be male and more likely to be white, less likely to be black. Um, they were more likely to have private insurance, 31% versus 27%, um, although there was no difference in the rate of um, governmental insurance, Medicaid or Medicare. And then not surprisingly, uh, the transferred patients lived on average, were on average 30 miles from their uh, discharging hospital compared to five miles. And a decent percentage of them, 10%, were over 100 miles from their home zip code um, compared to just 2% in patients that were not transferred. So that's pretty con um, considerable uh, difference when you consider the, um, the mortality rate being high among these patients, you know, possibly dying greater than 100 miles from your, from your home. In terms of the clinical characteristics, uh, transferred patients on average had a lower EFs, um, higher percentage, less than 40, on average 37%, and lower blood pressure, 130 versus 139 systolic, um, with other clinical variables like heart rate and, and common labs uh, being relatively unchanged between the two groups. Although for troponin and BNP, there was a high amount of missingness for these fields. Uh, as the units are really not standardized across multiple hospitals, and so they, they can be difficult to um, study in, in this um, scenario. Um, and then their outcomes. So uh, on average, um, transferred patients had a median length of stay of five days versus four days, not the double length of stay that had been quoted by, um, by other papers, but did have about double the in-hospital in mortality compared to non-transferred patients, 5% versus 2 and a half. And when you look at this at transplant centers only, the length of stay was even slightly longer for, trans for transferred patients at transplant centers. And the mortality was even higher, 7.7 versus 2.6%. For other clinical outcomes, the rate of in-hospital procedures like LVAD, balloon pump, dialysis, or transplant, right heart cath, and then use of inotropes, these were all higher in the transferred um, groups, I think pretty low overall, you know, one to five percent or so. Um, but when you look at um, the transplant centers, I mean, about a, almost a third of those patients received a right heart cath versus just 10 percent um, of non-transferred patients. Lots of them on dobutamine, 15 versus 2 percent, 13 versus 2 percent. So very high rates um, of usage and utilization of intravenous inotropes, right heart catheterization and mechanical support in this patient population. Yeah. Yeah, those were not um, on, those were not captured as well by the database, yeah. Um, I mean, we don't, for example, we don't really use dopamine because these things are widely available, but dopamine, you know, is easier to store than dobutamine and milrinone, which require specialized storage. So, you know, we might see dopamine more often um, as, an, as an inotrope, but um, don't have data on epi or norepi in isolation. Um, and then um, we computed odds ratios um, for these there was an adjustment model that we made, but it's being revised. Um, so I don't have those data right now. 
Um, but I think, you know, important to note, the point of this paper is not necessarily to adjust, um, is to balance the two cohorts and um, create a model to um, help predict. It's really, we actually really want the unadjusted outcomes of these patients to identify um, just how different of a patient population they, they are. Um, so for in-hospital mortality, you know, odds ratio of two to three uh, based on um, transplant center or not. Um, trans transferred patients were more likely to be, uh, sorry, less likely to be discharged home. And then interestingly, more likely to be prescribed uh, what we think of a guideline-directed medical therapy, ACE inhibitors, beta blocker, aldosterone receptor antagonist, and CRT. Um, the only exception being that ARNI usage was really the same in transferred versus non-transferred patients um, at both um, uh, transplant centers and non. Uh, so to summarize, you know, heart failure is the number two reason for admission to a hospital with over 1.1 million visits per year and costs on almost $13,000 per stay. This is 2018 data. I'm sure th these things have both increased in the last five years. Um, heart failure patients may be transferred more often than in other conditions. We saw an average of over 5% transfer rate here. Um, uh, prior, um, prior studies have identified, you know, a 1% to 4%. And then transfer is more common in the West and at hospitals that are small and large and academic and do heart transplants. Um, transferred patients are more likely to be younger, white, more male, and have private insurance and live further from, uh, from home, or sorry, further from where they're being admitted. And on admission, they have lower EFs and lower blood pressures. Uh, patients transferring to a transplant center required more inotropes and underwent more procedures overall. And in unadjusted analysis, transferred patients had longer lengths of stay, higher import, higher inpatient mortality, and these findings were accentuated at transplant centers. Transferred patients were also more likely to be prescribed uh, what we think of as guideline-directed medical therapy, um, and even more so at, at transplant centers, with the exception of the ARNI usage, as I mentioned. This is an interesting finding. I think one possible explanation is that the transferred patients had lower EF, so it's possible that more qualified for um, things like aldosterone receptor antagonist and CRT, which we wouldn't even consider unless the EF was less than 40%. Um, I think the other possibility, you know, specifically reg regarding the ARNI usage is that the transferred patients had lower blood pressures on average as well, um, which is the main side effect of ARNI. So if patients were a little bit lower to start off, we may not reach for that as often as, say, like a low dose ACE or ARB. So, in conclusion, um, further studies are needed to elucidate specific factors associated with adverse outcomes in this patient population and um, ex examine, um, you know, what benefit, if any, these patients get from transfer specifically. Um, and then transfer specifically in this heart failure population, um, you know, having seen these data are now, in a, I think, an attractive target for quality improvement efforts to try and improve outcomes of care. Um, so that's my next step is to look locally here um, at uh, our hospital, looking at outcomes um, of our transferred patients and see where we can intervene um, to uh, using this registry data as a benchmark um, to try and improve our own outcomes here. Um, oddly, it was harder. It was. It's been easier to get um, national registry data than it is from data on the patients I see every day. Um, so we're in a, a long uh, process working with Health Data Compass, trying to get data from our own hospital um, and uh, take the next step. And I'll be talking about some of these efforts uh, in two weeks at the Shark Tank Grand Rounds for the Department of Medicine um, to try and get some support to to launch this here. Um, thanks to Dr. Allen, my primary mentor, um, and my co-investigators, uh, Dr. Ho and Dr. Peterson here, and then um, Dr. Fonero and Karen Maddox um, as, at WashU, and then the STATS team, which are all from the Duke Clinical Research Institute. Um, thanks, and uh, happy to take questions. All right, that was great. Thanks. Hi, Eric. That's excellent, excellent work. Um, 
you mentioned at the end that like the transferred patients were more likely to be white, more likely to be younger. I guess the question is, is there a like a bias or equity question when it comes to transfer? Like are patients that um, need to be transferred are not getting transferred because of, you know, gender or race or whatever? And can you look more into that using the data that you have? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there has definitely been, um, there have definitely been disparities described in transferred patients. Um, there's kind of one person that does a lot of uh, this research um, out of uh, one of the Harvard hospitals. Um, and she's definitely, she has published on, on this as well, um, racial disparities and uh, sex disparities in um, transferred patients. Um, so I think it's very clear that there uh, are differences in patients that are transferred and not. Um, and I, I think it'd be hard to dig deeper with what we have at this point as to why that might be, um, you know, without specific chart review. Um, but uh, I, I think this is one of the more interesting findings that really highlights, um, you know, who gets transferred and, and, and why I think there's, there's obvious disparity here. Great job. This is a topic near and dear to my, my heart, actually. Um, a couple of things. Um, how, did you happen to look at patients coming from an ER versus an inpatient admission? Um, the circumstances of those are quite different uh, with EMTALA and not, basically. Um, you mean if a patient showed up to an emergency room and then got transferred from an from ER to another. Yeah, yeah, so those patients were not, um, would not be considered transferred in this. They had to okay. start um, from another uh, hospital, from, from another, an, okay. from another okay. ad admission, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. a, um, now, yeah, it's what, a now what Now what might be, thing. what might be different in there is patients that, you know, come in through the ER versus like directly admitted from, from clinic, that, that might be another different scenario, but Mm -hmm. seems to be far less common. So um, that was not well captured in, in this database. Yeah, the uh, as you know, the uh, ER admissions, you can't turn them down, right? You have to take right. them immediately and all that. And hospital transfers could be Thanksgiving as the reason for transfer, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Um, so anyway, a uh, couple of just other suggestions. One, um, you might look at, at Slicer Dicer and see how much you can get out of that, maybe with one yeah. of the analysts. Um, yeah. Compass is slow. Uh, two is if you do look at the administrative, like uh, ARC data, you can tell who's been transferred in, like that's the source of admission, and you can actually infer people who are, trans, you know, from, yeah. from one place to another because they have a, a readmission code so that um, you, can, you can sort of match that up. So anyway. I yeah, just, just those are those are things one. definitely um, that we're looking at. I actually have all of the um, data in uh, Slicer Dicer. Um, yeah, so. It's getting it ex exported um, and analyzed. That's our our uh, current roadblock. Yeah, that, that's what on the IT side. That's what yeah. we do now. <laughs> so. But we'll get there. Um, one other thing, Ab, just to your point, um, you, you know, these uh, disparities are not ex not explained by differences. Um, in say the percentage that are made up by Medicaid or uh, Medicare, there is a slightly lower rate of Medicare in um, the transferred population, but similar rates of Medicare. So insurance status doesn't seem to be a huge driver of these um, age and racial disparities. As I say, if you looked at the, the other question is if you looked at the type of hospitals like for-profit versus non-profit. Yeah, and there is not, um, the rates of transfer for the prop for hospital ownership are actually very similar. But I mean, like stratified by insurance types. Oh, with insurance, um, we did not get to that. Yeah, level. I guess that was my broader question. Was so you know you're getting going to get local data, kind of get a sense of what's going on here. Do you think you can go back after you've done that to the registry and get some new questions about how local behaviors or, or ideas to sort of frame it a little more nuanced than just how the country as a whole is doing? Yeah, I, uh, I think that'd be great. Um, this is my first experience working with a national registry. Um, we were pretty broad in our initial request and asked for a lot of data values because my understanding is that going back and asking for revisions is 
may, may be frowned upon. Uh, I'm not really sure. So we'll have to see how that how that plays out with. Um, uh, but um, I think you know we have actually a lot more tables, a lot more data that I didn't that I didn't show here today because it wasn't as exciting. But um, hopefully we can look through the nuance in that. Else. Thanks, Eric. Thanks. That look good. Okay, good to go. Oh, hello, my name is <laughs> Mae Verdon. and I'm one of the second year general cardiology fellows. And I'm gonna be presenting my, oh, did you get an email? I'm sorry. Did you get an email? Okay, all right, sounds good. Okay, um, so I'm going to be presenting my research talk entitled Clinical and Functional Differences in Heart Failure Phenotypes Across the Ejection Fraction Spectrum. Um, so a couple objectives of the talk today, um, I'm going to go into kind of understanding the historical perspective of classifying heart failure patients by left ventricular ejection fraction. Um, we'll challenge the current model for categorizing heart failure patients by EF. We'll identify heart failure as a syndrome across the spectrum of clinical phenotypes, discuss the applications of artificial intelligence in healthcare, and propose a new model for phenotyping heart failure patients that provides predictive information. And I forgot to say that I, I work with Dave Kay over there. So, <laughs> all right. So, um, According to the 2022 ACCA AJHFSA guidelines for the management of heart failure, they defined heart failure as a complex syndrome with symptoms and signs that results from any structural or functional impairment of ventricular filling or ejection of blood. And the current guidelines classify patients um, into different groups based on the ejection fraction with patients who have an EF less than 40% being classified as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, uh, patients who have an EF greater than 50% being classified as having preserved ejection fraction, and then there's kind of this middle range group between 40 and 50 that are mildly reduced, heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. And these EF percentages are important because they provide prognostic information. Now we know that patients with heart failure have lower ejection fractions have higher mortality. Um, from a historical perspective, classifying heart failure patients by EF stems from precedent that have been set by randomized uh, clinical trials, and these RCTs have arbitrarily selected for patients with lower ejection fractions to enhance statistical power by enrolling those patients with the worst overall prognosis. And this uh, approach has shown important clinical benefit with the development of several drugs and devices down the line. And while EF remains an informative measure, there's several disadvantages to this paradigm, which we'll go into. And um, there's been increasing awareness of the clinical overlap among heart failure patients and growing support for looking beyond EF as a primary basis for stratifying these patients. And this is a review article published a few years ago in the European Heart Journal of 42 heart failure researchers around the world who kind of agreed to that statement. Um, so three of the most commonly cited disadvantages of using left ventricular ejection fraction is the first that there are many shared epidemiological features among heart failure patients and some of the pathophysiologic mechanisms may not be mutually, mutually exclusive. Um, we know that there are many common shared dis, uh, risk factors and disease modifiers like hypertension, obesity, diabetes that are found in both type, in all patients with heart failure. And um, there's endothelial dysfunction, myocardial fibrosis, and um, as well, you know, found in all types of heart failure as well. And the measurement of left ventricular ejection fraction is often imprecise and can vary between observers and uh, methods, whether that's echo, nuke, or CT, or even MRI. And EF alone is not a great predictor of adverse outcomes. We know it predicts cardiovascular mortality, but it doesn't necessarily predict who's going to be hospitalized for heart failure um, or all-cause mortality. So instead, we like to think of heart failure as a heterogeneous syndrome across the spectrum of clinical phenotypes, where each patient follows a unique trajectory based on their initial trigger, their genetics, their clinical comorbid conditions, their backgrounds, and any available treatment that they may have been on. And advances in technology and the emerging field of precision medicine has allowed for a novel data-driven approach to phenotyping heart failure patients.
Um, so briefly, uh, precision medicine represents a care strategy where we target an individual's differences in their genetics, their lifestyle, their health factors that um, contribute to their disease phenotype. And the goal of precision medicine is to provide individualized care rather than care based on the average of a population. And it requires a rapid synthesis of changing data sets and advances in artificial intelligence technologies are crucial to implementing these pathways in healthcare. And the rapid expansion of re readily available patient data is allowed for the application of these technologies in medicine. And then, um, so machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence that builds analytical models by learning from existing data and has emerged as a powerful discipline, a uh, powerful tool um, to analyze complex patterns and data that may not be readily apparent. And these algorithms have broad application in heart failure from trial design, predicting who's going to decompensate from their heart failure, um, who's going to benefit from certain drugs or device therapies, um, how are we going to screen for these patients, and then um, in particular in our case, how do we discover different phenotypes of heart failure patients. So um, these algorithms have been used to phenotype HEF-PEF and HEF-REF patients separately, but they don't necessarily predict, uh, reflect the reality that these phenotypes may span the EF spectrum. And we believe moving beyond EF, similar to those other heart failure researchers, is important. So um, our study objective, we're going to be used un using unsupervised machine learning uh, techniques to define and characterize different heart failure phenotypes across the ejection fraction spectrum using a large repository of patient data with three main goals. Um, one is to use the latent class analysis modeling to identify heart failure phenotypes. We'll be determining the implication of these heart failure phenotypes on functional status and clinical outcomes. And um, we will identify differences in subgroup-specific treatment response and we hypothesize that phenotype-based classification system will provide additional prognostic information and the treatment responses that we see will vary in a very specific manner. So um, this is a secondary analysis of data that we obtained from 19 different heart failure clinical trials. And all the de data elements were harmonized into a single data set by Dr. Kao. And um, we performed latent class analysis modeling, which is basically a more sophisticated clustering analysis. And we um, clustered essentially based on these manifest variables, which are listed in the right-hand column. And these variables were selected um, because they've previously been studied in independent LCA analysis of HEF-REF and have PEP patients. And we'll be taking a look at their patient reported outcomes, their six minute walk trends, their clinical outcomes, and then treatment responses. Um, so this is a table that shows all the different um, clinical trials where we obtained our data from. And we'll go into the results. So um, in total, we had over 26,000 patients that were included in our analysis from those 19 different uh, clinical trials. And our latent class analysis identified that the optimum, optimal number of classes or, or phenotypes in our case was six. And we named these phenotypes according to the most pre uh, prevalent clinical characteristics, with the first phenotype um, being the hypertensive phenotype, the second phenotype being an idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, the third phenotype phenotype being insulin resistant, uh, fourth, a, a multimorbid ischemic, fifth, a non-ischemic elderly, and then um, sixth was a premature ischemic phenotype. So um, those were supposed to fly in, but um, here are baseline characteristics by phenotype, um, showing basically our manifest variables and the percentages in each. And so the, the column on the left-hand side there um, is, is our hypertensive phenotype, and we see that those patients tend to be slightly older, mostly female, and had a high prevalence of hypertension with relatively few other comorbid conditions. Um, the next column of the next column is our idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. These patients were young, younger and had pretty uh, a fewer comorbid conditions. And then we had our insulin resistant phenotype. Um, those patients were overweight to obese and had a high prevalence of diabetes and hypertension. And then we had our multimorbid ischemic, again, older patients, um, high prevalence of chronic kidney disease, uh, coronary disease, and atrial arrhythmias. And then we had our non-ischemic elderly uh, phenotype, which um, older patients, uh, and interestingly, the BMI was around 18, um, so pretty low. And then um, a lot of hypertension and atrial arrhythmias, but almost no coronary disease. And finally was our premature ischemic phenotype. So these were most often younger male patients with lots of coronary disease. 
Um, so this is uh, looking at left ventricular ejection fraction by clinical phenotype. And on the x-axis, we have our LVF percentage. And then the y-axis, we have the density of patients included. And um, this is important because our latent class modeling didn't include EF in, the, in our analysis or in the, phenotype, in the analysis. And we see that these phenotypes span the EF spectrum. We see almost a bimodal distribution for the hypertensive, multimorbid, ischemic, and non-ischemic elderly uh, phenotypes. And then a predominantly lower EF phenotype for idiopathic insulin resistant and then premature ischemic. Um, next, we looked at patient reported and functional outcomes by phenotypes. So across the top of those box plots, we have the KCCQ and Minnesota Living with Heart Failure questionnaires that were obtained from our trial uh, data. And um, as you guys probably know, a lower KCCQ score indicates uh, poor kind of self-perceived health status, and whereas higher indicates uh, as higher Minnesota Living with Heart Failure score indicates poor perceived health status. And um, we kind of see that these, these phenotypes, um, they differ significantly, and the patterns that we see were concordant across multiple different clinical trials with the insulin-resistant phenotype having some of the worst patient-reported outcomes and the hypertensive phenotype having some of the best, and that's the green and red bar, uh, respectively. And then um, on the bottom of these two graphs here, we have our functional outcomes, so six-minute walk distance and baseline VO2. And similarly, these findings were concordant across uh, multiple trials with insulin resistant, multimorbid ischemic, and non ischemic elderly phenotypes having some of the worst functional outcomes. Yeah. And then finally, we looked at um, uh, clinical outcomes by phenotypes. So it's a cluster heat map for the primary outcome for each heart failure and then each phenotype. And um, we looked at cardiovascular mortality and heart failure hospitalizations when they're available in the standard of care and the placebo arm. And what we see is that there is a higher event rate for the primary outcome in the insulin resistant, non ischemic, elderly, and multi morbid ischemic phenotypes, uh, as demonstrated by the darker purple, um, darker purple colors up there, and then kind of a lower event rate for the primary outcome and the hypertensive uh, phenotype. And so then we um, took a look at uh, the hazard ratios for the primary outcome for each phenotype using our hypertensive population as the control since they had the best um, overall outcomes initially. And um, when compared to the other phenotypes, the hypertensive, um, the other phenotypes had our higher uh, rates of cardiovascular mortality and heart failure hospitalizations. And there's almost a twofold increase in TB mortality and hospitalizations in the insulin resistant and multimorbid phenotypes phenotypes. And then um, busy slide here, but we look at treatment specific responses by phenotypes. We have the survival curves on the top left hand there. Uh, we have enalapril versus placebo. On the top right, we have exercise training versus usual care. Um, and then on the bottom left, we have bypass surgery versus medical therapy by each phenotype. And um, what we see is that treatment with enalapril reduced the primary outcome for the hypertensive, idiopathic, multimorbid ischemic, and premature ischemic phenotypes. And um, we saw a reduction in heart failure hospitalizations with the non-ischemic elderly phenotypes. And then for the um, exercise training, we saw a significant reduction in the primary outcome for the hypertensive and non-ischemic elderly phenotypes. And then for bypass surgery, we saw just a reduction in the primary outcome for the premature ischemic phenotype only. And so this kind of uh, goes to show that maybe some therapies are beneficial across all heart failure phenotypes, whereas others may be phenotype specific, um, kind of similar to why we see benefit for SGLT2 patients in all heart failure patients. Um, so in conclusion, we used a data-driven approach to characterize heart failure phenotypes. We provided prognostic information, identified uh, therapeutic heterogeneity, and these findings suggest that combinations of clinical features may manifest with a wide range of EF and provide predictive information beyond EF alone. And these findings show that this is a useful tool for identifying heart failure subgroups across a, an EF spectrum and may serve as a launching point for more um, for targeted investigations of a more homogeneous group of heart failure patients. And um, obviously there's a couple limitations that we want to point out. So the secondary retrospective analysis. Um, this analysis assumes that any future population of interest is similar to those enrolled in our in the 19 clinical trials that we use, which may not necessarily be the case. Um, and uh, these 
uh, feeding types identified by our LCA represent associations of variables and may not reflect any sort of pathophysiology. And um, harmonizing data from into a single data set is inherently very difficult. And these are hypothesis generating findings only. So future directions um, will be translating these definitions into simplified criteria for clinical use and then um, hopefully expanding into real world data, including multi-omics data as part of the AMP heart failure study. And thank you, thank you, Dr. Kao, and great. That was great. Um, questions? Hi. Hello. Um, thanks for the great talk. We spent a lot of time in the lab trying to develop better animal models of heart failure. And the recent trend is to um, superimpose multiple comorbidities, obesity, uh, insulin resistance, hypertension, et cetera. And we think of those as non-ischemic models, but you don't even have a multimorbid non-ischemic category. Um, can you tell us why? We, we don't, or? Well, I mean, you have an, an ischemic multimorbid category, but I didn't see a non-ischemic multimorbid category. I think that's probably, we had like a non-ischemic elderly phenotype. They did have a high prevalence of hypertension and some atrial arrhythmias, not necessarily coronary disease. And I think from at least the review of the literature, we do see that that's a common, um, you know, phenotype that's represented, at least in patients per se. Um, yeah, that was great. Any other questions? Hi, Maeve. That was great. Um, like, how does the how does the data generate the, the phenotypes? Because like the hypertensive phenotype has only seventy five percent hypertension, and you would think that like they would all have hypertension if it's hypertensive heart failure. Right. I'm just curious it, to how like it groups it or it comes up with the phenotypes. Yeah, that's a good question. It just kind of that, you know, we plug everything into a model and then it just spits out the data and we basically name them based on the most common um, clinical comorbid condition. So hypertension within that group, hypertension was most prevalent. Um, but you're right, not everybody had a history of hypertension. So why not everybody had a history of hypertension? I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was good. Ask something similar. Um, when you do your sort of modeling for predicting future um, events or, or characteristics, did you actually inc try including some of those um, other variables as covariates or just the cluster number? Um, because you know, to your point, I mean, it's it's capturing some kind of latent you know thing that makes them similar. Maybe it's hypertension, but there may be other you know variables um, that we would think that would come out if you adjust for something like hypertension or coronary disease. Yeah, that's it. I don't think we've done that. Uh, the clusters are independent of... Yeah. Awesome. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Eric.